Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. And also by the Public Health Professionals membership site. This is where healthcare professionals from all over the world, all different modalities, yoga teachers to PTs to movement educators to doctors, this is where they all come together to collaborate and learn about all things public health. In there, we have an up-to-date library of resources, an online private group, monthly Q&A calls, and access to amazing pelvic health experts from around the world. To find out more, visit pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Welcome to episode 128 of the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I'm a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant who works for yoga teachers. This podcast was created for you so that you can connect to information and inspiration every single week and feel supported as you do all of the work that is involved in being a yoga teacher and a business owner. This week, I have an exciting episode for you. We're talking about yoga's sister science, Ayurveda. I haven't touched on this topic much on the podcast yet. And even though it is often covered in yoga teacher training at some level, a lot of us don't incorporate Ayurveda into our classes, or we want to, and we just don't know how, or we'd like to hear how a yoga teacher themes all classes using Ayurveda. This is why I am thrilled to have Angela on the show today to share with us how we can reconnect the sister sciences, yoga and Ayurveda. Angela covered so many things in this episode, especially around defining what our dosha is and really helping to use that information to thrive in teaching, being a business owner, and also living your life. Before we dive in to meet Angela and hear more about the doshas, I just want to call to mind back in episode 124, so not that far back, Sarah Jane Case talked to us about the Enneagram, which is a personality test, and how we could use that information in a compassionate way to inform us how to run a business or how to embrace our unique personalities. And I really want to invite you to go back and have a listen to that if you haven't already, and to have a little bit of inquiry with yourself in terms of what dosha you think you are. Maybe you decide to go and find out what your dosha is. Maybe you've heard to really take this information in with the whole understanding of Ayurveda. And what I've heard a few people doing since the episode with Sarah Jane Case is to connect the doshas and Ayurveda with this. So I think it's pretty fascinating and pretty fun if we can look at self in this place of inquiry, non-judgment, and self-compassion. All of the show notes for today's episode are ready for you back at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 128. So if you're out and about and busy, don't worry, they're all there for you. I want to say a huge thank you to Marcy Reynolds, who left us a review. Marcy says, I've been listening to the podcast for more than a year and part of the Facebook group for about four months. Both are awesome. I've learned so much from the content in the podcast and relish the support and information sharing that happens in the Facebook group. Well done. Thank you so much, Marcy. It means a lot that you took the time to leave a review. That's one of the best gifts that you can offer to a podcaster. And I am so glad that you feel like the podcast and the Facebook group are really supporting you in the work that you do as a yoga teacher. If you have not left us a review yet, can you head over to iTunes or to our Facebook page and do that? I would love to read it out on the podcast. And here is a hot tip from our sponsor, Schedulicity. Hello, Connected Yoga Teachers. This is Allison with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Feng Shui your yoga space by getting rid of appointment books, messy calendars, and stacks of sign-in sheets. Keep your business energy flowing with the new advanced marketing option. So Shannon, Blake asked you what you'd like to automate and you said everything. We agree. Now you can automate your thank you messages, birthday greetings, time to book reminders, and re-engagement discounts for people you haven't seen in a long time. Set and forget your preferences and stay even more connected with your clients. 
You can also promote your services and products at the time of online booking to add even more value to your clients' visits. If you're looking to attract more prosperity in your business life, add some elements of wood and water and check out Advanced Marketing. Thank you so much, Team Schedulicity. You make my life so much easier when I can use your scheduling software, book people, get people to pay through that app all at the same time. (laughs) It really does simplify it. It's like Schedulicity is part of the team. Let's dive in, connected yoga teachers, and meet Angela Glass. Angela is a 500 ERYT, Ayurvedic counselor, and the founder of Eka Yoga. She came to yoga in 2002 as a means of alleviating chronic back pain and symptoms of depression. Since then, Angela has traveled to India twice to deepen her own practice and to study yoga through the Himalaya Yoga Valley, an internationally accredited yoga program, and Ayurveda with Dr. Rohit Borkar. I hope I'm saying that properly. And most recently, Angela completed the Ayurveda counseling program at the Karela Ayurveda Academy. I'm so excited, Connected Yoga Teachers, that you get to hear from Angela today. Her passion for teaching and strong belief that every individual's unique qualities should be honored is what inspired her to create Eka Yoga in 2015. Eka Yoga is a yoga studio and an online platform that is dedicated to reconnecting yoga and Ayurveda through education and inspiration. And I find this fascinating. Wait until you hear how Angela has organized her classes to go in line with Ayurveda. It's pretty amazing. So let's dive in and meet Angela. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Angela. It's great to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Shannon. Tell us, where did your yoga journey begin? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, I do. (laughs) Um, So I started yoga by accident. Um, I like to say I used to hate people, which is such a funny thing to say, but I had a lot of mental and physical issues that just made me very unhappy. And um, when I was in college, a friend got me to go to a yoga class. And keep in mind, this was about 15 years ago in the Midwest. So like, that was like crazy, some hippy dippy <laughs> stuff. Um, but I went and I, I hated it because it was the first time I had to be alone with my thoughts and myself and really feel my body. Um, But I also was a cheap college student, so I'd bought this package. (laughs) So I kept going. (laughs) And then I realized um, it was weird because I wasn't paying attention on purpose, but I started to realize that I was starting to sleep better and my back felt better and my my digestion was getting better. So then I just kept going and it kind of snowballed from that point on. That's amazing. So then fast forward to now, what what has led you to the work that you do now? Tell us what is the work that you do and who do you do it for and, and what led you there? Okay. Um, so at this point, um, I own a yoga studio in Seattle and the concept behind the studio is to reconnect yoga and Ayurveda because this gives practitioners a better idea of how to practice for their unique body type. And how I got to this point again is I said that I had a lot of health issues. I had I was actually diagnosed with depression around eight years old, so really young, just because of some trauma in the family. So it's something I was always dealing with. And I guess backtrack to when I was in college again, um, I started to go to yoga so much that they asked me to become a teacher. And at that point, you didn't need a 200 hour. They're like, we'll just train you. <laughs> so I started teaching. Um, at my college. And then we had this workshop with a professor that studied yoga in India. And I was introduced to the eight limbs and, you know, more than just the asana. And I was like, it blew my mind. I was like, that's what I'm doing. So about a year after I graduated, I went to India then to study yoga and I was introduced to Ayurveda. And just the concept for me that they're like, hey, your body type should cook food and you're going to feel a lot better, a lot better rather than eating raw vegetables it totally shifted everything. And I was like, why doesn't everybody know about this? This is amazing. (laughs) And so again, this was almost 15, 10, 15 years ago. So 
when I got back from India, I was just getting books and reading everything I could on Ayurveda just to heal my own body. And then I just continued to study it. I ended up going back to India. I don't know how many years later, maybe five years later. And then I studied with an Ayurvedic doctor there. I studied more yoga. And then I had the idea to open the yoga studio when doing my final project while I was in India. So when did you open the yoga studio then? Um, 2016. So we're still a baby. Right. But you've been teaching for a while. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Can you talk to me about, you know, is there a division between yoga and Ayurveda or is it sort of the same thing now that you understand it? It is. It's the same thing. So yoga is actually a tool to help us heal our body. Like it's part of Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is a 5,000 year old healing tradition. It believes that we're all unique. So what we need in our diet, our lifestyle, our exercise is going to be unique. And then it also believes in preventative health. So it gives us all these tools we need to actually take care of ourselves. And then one of these tools besides diet and um, like our lifestyle choices and exercise is yoga. So yoga is more it's not thought of as an exercise in Ayurveda. It's more of that mindfulness and that action and that movement to um, heal particular parts of your body as well as your mind. Okay. That's good. Does does that make sense? It does. And a lot of, you know, a lot of yoga teachers will go on to study Ayurveda or they'll bring it into their classes in some way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really excited that we get to chat with you today and just find out sort of how we might bring this into our yoga classes. I think where I'd like to begin is with the doshas. And I I also just want to acknowledge that when I've learned anything about Ayurveda or the doshas, I feel like I'm just learning the very tip of it. Like there's so much more to it. So I do realize that I'm asking you to explain something that is, could take, you know, the whole year to explain on a podcast. But if you could explain the doshas, okay, how would you explain those? So just break down each one. Sure. Okay. All right. So we'll start with vata dosha. And so the three doshas are actually comprised of two of the five elements, which are air, space, fire, water, and earth. Vata is air and space. And it's known as the king of the doshas and the mover of the doshas as it's responsible for the movement of everything, including the other two doshas. So if you think of space, it's very expansive. So that's one of its qualities. And then air, think of wind, it's this moving energy. So when we have excess vata or just vata in our body, it's making everything happen, every function in our body. But too much of it can make our mind feel scattered and unfocused. It can make us feel anxious, worried, um, cause insomnia. And if we think again of space, that expanding quality, those that are vata dominant or vata imbalanced are more prone to bloating. Um, and not to confuse people even more, but there are actually five sub doshas to each dosha. So oh, we won't I go into that. that, but that helps like when for Ayurvedic, like wellness coaches and practitioners, these sub doshas help us better identify issues within the body and then find the resolutions to fix them or bring them back in balance. Um, So yeah, vata is just that moving energy. And so it's good too. All of the doshas are good. It doesn't matter which one you are. It's just learning how to embrace them. So we we don't want to eliminate vata because it's what gives us our creativity and our flexibility. And um, people that are vata dominant are the creators. They like to write and draw and sing and dance and just create, right? Um, So that's the vata dosha, I guess, in a nutshell. Okay. I like how you said vata dominant because this is one discussion we often have in our house. This is what happens when two yoga teachers live together, Sean and I. (laughs) Uh, We often have this discussion like, uh, is a person a certain dosha? and, And then are they that all the time? Or do we have each dosha within us? That is a good question. How about I'll go through the the rest of the doshas and then I'll answer that because that's a whole nother explanation. Okay. Um, 
So, okay, next dosha, dosha is the pitta dosha, which is comprised of fire and water. And it's predominantly fire. And we say that because pitta needs a little bit of water. Otherwise, if it was just all fire, it would burn up. You would just, too much fire. So that water helps keep, keeps the fire element balanced in the body. So those that are um, pitta dominant, think fire. Fire is very sharp. Um, those people tend to be, be direct. They're self-confident. Um, they have very precise language. They are usually the CEOs of things. They're really good at giving speeches. Um, they're very driven and they can be very passionate. But if there's too much of that fire, what is, like when we think about fire, you know, we think of like those cartoons. So they're more prone to anger and getting irritated or inflammation in the body, such as heartburn and acid reflux. Um, but again, pitta is not bad. Pitta people aren't bad. We need that pitta to give us our self-confidence, right? It's too much pitta can be ego, but we all need self-confidence to survive and, and move forward. We need that pitta to balance out kapha, which we'll talk about in a minute, so we don't feel stuck, right? To have that um, that energy to move forward, to transform. Pitta is also part of what helps us digest everything that we see, feel, hear, eat, experience. Um, I think that's it for Pitta. That's Pitta in a nutshell. Any questions on Pitta? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really like how you brought in the water part of this because I'm, anytime I've ever been uh, looking at any dosha quiz or talk to anyone who works with the doshas, I always get a pitta, your pitta, and I love swimming. And it does really calm me to mm -hmm. bring water into my meditation. So, mm. and you can tell you've got that pitta too. I, when I wrote to you, I said this, but you are very precise with your language. You're very good and you're very organized at like, moderating your Facebook group. Not that I'm stalking you, but, but it's something I've, you know, observed. And I think I've been studying this so long, like it just comes natural. I, I can like tell what dosha people are, you know, mentally and then physically, but yeah, you've got that pitta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so also it can come like into some fire when I'm talking about politics or really excited at a hockey game or raising my kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so just like, learning how to balance it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now kapha. Kapha is earth and water. And so those elements, they're very heavy. And I always like to think of those elements together because if you mix earth and water, you get mud. So kapha is very sticky and heavy and slow. Um, so those that are kapha dominant, tend to move slower. Maybe their uh, response time is a little slower. And again, this isn't bad. Kaphas tend to marinate, marinate on what they're asked. And so they take their time and give a thoughtful answer. So for someone that is pitta or vata dominant, they can be like, why aren't you answering? <laughs> you know what I mean? They want that movement, that action. Um, pittas are more prone to congestion. So think of, again, that sticky energy. So Or the kapha? Or the kapha? Is? The kapha, yeah, sorry. That's okay. So kapha tends to have that congestion in their chest, in their throat, in their face. Um, they're known as the lovers of the dosha because they're really grounded and they tend to be more nurturing. Um, they tend to actually be more fertile than the other two doshas, those people that are dominant in kapha. Um, but when kapha, again, is imbalanced, they experience that congestion or um, they can become one with the couch, right? They have a hard time getting more motivated. So they need a little kick in the pants to get moving, but they also then, because they have that strong earth energy, they're the ones that have a lot of endurance and strength when they do get moving. Okay, amazing. I feel like you're you're describing me in the winter time. Yes, and that's kapha season, so it makes makes sense for all of us. Yeah. So, how do we know what dosha we are? And I think my other question is, how do we not see everything through that lens? Like, 
oh, well, I'm Pitta, so I'm really fiery or I'm, do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, that is a great question. So you were asking when we just started talking about the doshas, you know, how do you know the difference? Are you that dosha forever? Well, we have what's called our prakruti and our vikruti. So our prakruti is the combination of the elements and the doshas in our body at the time of conception, and that will never change. So that's what gives us our unique features and our unique personality. So depending on what test you take and how you take it, because you can get different results, like you were saying, um, that should give you an accurate, accurate description of you in a balanced state. So every, most people are dominant in one dosha, but again, we carry all of them. So on my dosha test that I have on my website, I give an explanation of how to take it. You want to take the dosha test answering the questions, how you are the majority of the time, so not how you're feeling in the moment. So even thinking back to when you were a kid, you know, those things you enjoyed more, or how your hair or your skin or your eyes were. Um, I also tell people to maybe have your mom, dad, sister, brother, someone that's known you your whole life, take it for you as well. So both of you take it and you're going to get more of a <laughs> accurate description because sometimes we lie to ourselves. <laughs> right. Um, so that's going to give you more of your prakruti, your natural state of being. But then it's good to know about all of the doshas just to recognize when they get imbalanced within your body. And that's vikruti. So like you were saying in the winter, you feel kapha. That would be your vikruti then. You're experiencing more of the earth and water elements because we see those more in winter. So we all tend to feel a little more heavy and lethargic and lazy. Whereas in the summer, when the sun is shining and it's hot, we all have that pitta energy. We're ready to go and do lots of different activities. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. And so when you say we just need to watch for that imbalance, we could, like when you were describing the vata and this scattered, I definitely have moments in my life where I'm feeling really scattered. And so could I say that that is a little bit of vata imbalance within me, even though that's not my dosha? Exactly. So it's your vikruti, your current imbalance state. Okay. And so if you have all that excess moving energy, what do you think you do to balance it? Uh, well, I do a lot of things. <laughs> what doesn't work is trying to do all those things. Right. It's so usually, you want to find... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. It's interesting because I just went through it this week. I was like, I'm just going to get things done and making more to-do lists and working later and doing that didn't help. What helped is taking the weekend off. Yes. Yeah. So you, you grounded, yeah. you're right? You brought in more of that earth energy to balance the air in the space. Yeah. So oh, that's easier, fascinating. So it it's can easier really... when we, yeah, it's easier when we think of it in terms of the elements, even more than the doshas. Because you want, like increases like. So if we're feeling a certain way, we want to bring in the opposite qualities to create balance. Okay. So go through the elements again. The vata was space and air. air yep. Space and air. And then pitta is fire and water. And then kapha is earth and water. Okay. There's no wood there. For some reason, no, why am I, I think, thinking that? <laughs> I think in Chinese medicine, they use wood. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh is there anything that you've learned about the doshas that has really helped you as a yoga teacher? Yes, a lot. <laughs> um, it helps me just in life. It's more, it's on the mat and off the mat because you start to see people's doshas and then you can honor that. So like I said like a kapha person might be slower to respond and for vata and pitta that can be drive them crazy because they're, they want to move. And so the same, like pittas are very direct with their words. And sometimes for a vata that's more emotional, they could be offended by a pitta's words, even though pitta wasn't trying to be mean, they were just saying directly what they meant. Right? So just observing those differences and honoring how people communicate, honoring how people want and need to move their bodies if we're talking about in a yoga practice. And then also 
teaching people to recognize this within themselves and then others they communicate with and, you know, for them, how to use it on their mat and also off of their mat. That's fascinating. So then how would we bring that into a yoga class, say, if we wanted to teach the doshas or teach something Ayurveda? That's a great question. So at our studio, um, we have classes that we actually cater to each of the doshas. And how we have it broken down here is the pitta class. Pitta, again, fire and water. Pittas tend to be more competitive. So we want to bring in those opposite qualities. We need to cool down. We need to ground down. So it's more of a restorative yin-like class. And for pittas that are new to this, it can make them feel aggravated and irritated because they want to to move. Does that resonate with you? (laughs) You can see me like, "Ah." I'm just remembering back to my first early days learning about yoga, doing yoga, uh, and even becoming a yoga teacher. I really wanted to find like the hot flow classes. And that was probably the opposite of what I needed to, to come back into balance. <laughs> and it, it is all about balance. So it's, you're not, it's not saying that pittas can't do that flow because they have that natural competitive nature. So they should do that. But um, just to keep things aligned so people know what they're getting into when they come to our classes, you know, we make that a restorative class and, you know, saying that you should do it when you feel you're feeling irritated or aggravated or your body's literally burnt out, right? That's when you need those restorative and those slow and cooling classes. So then what kind of classes really help if we're feeling a vata imbalance? What helps to to bring us back into balance. The restorative class can help as well, but how we have it designed here is it's more of a hatha class. So it's still very slow paced, but there's still strength in there. So vatas tend to be um, weaker, um, they, especially they have weakness in their joints. They have a hard time um, building muscle on their body. So we'll hold the poses for you know anywhere from three to 10 breaths. They'll still be warriors. Maybe we'll do a plank but it's that hold, that stillness. So vata's air and water, I'm sorry, air and space. So we bring in that stillness, the earth energy, and then those more challenging postures are also going to bring in that fire because they're building heat, which will balance air and space. Okay. And then what about for the kaphas? I feel like you're just going to make them do like a hot vinyasa flow. (laughs) Close, close. (laughs) So they do need that. They need the movement. They need the kick in the pants, right? They're not going to want to do it. But once they get flowing and moving, then they're the, they're usually the best in class. They're the ones that can do it. Right. To keep going, to have that stick with it. That is uh, exactly how I feel in the winter when it's really snowy and cold here. I don't want to get outside at all. I just want to hibernate. And then once I get outside, then I barely want to come inside again. Yeah. I'm sure that our listeners can hear a lot of different qualities in themselves and in others. Do you have any words of wisdom around uh, attaching yourself to a dosha or other people like all of a sudden now I'm starting to pick it out in my children thinking I wonder which dosha they are which I think I have all three uh (laughs) anything around that because I feel like it could be quite confrontational if we jump at a student and say well that's because you're vata or or kappa you don't ever say that (laughs) (laughs) but um don't put yourself in a box don't put other people in a box but you know you can observe these things and it helps us better understand how to communicate. So if you do notice someone's fiery, right? If you're going to be fiery right back to them, you guys are going to combust. Like, you know. Right. So you're like, okay, how can I bring in these opposite qualities to have a good discussion with this person? Um and then for yourself, again not putting yourself in that box, but just observing, just like we learn in yoga, just listening to your body. And once you have the understanding, the basic concepts of each of these doshas, 
right? Just observing all of them, not saying, oh, I'm always Vata, so I need this, but saying, how do I feel right now in this moment? And then catering to those needs. So I have a technical question about your your yoga studio. If all of your classes are divided for the doshas, do people take an online dosha test first and then decide which class they want to go to? And then do they ever switch around and go to a different one? So yes, we do have an online dosha test. And then we have a little marker board version at the studio if people didn't take it or they're not familiar with Ayurveda, which most aren't. It's a new, a newer thing. Um, and most people are fascinated and really excited about it. But we do have, it's almost like a warning blurb. So it says that, you know, we're all of the dosha. So it's, again, just listen to your body. Just because you come out this one dosha doesn't mean this is the class you should do every single time. And people's schedules don't work that way either. You know, right. if they're only one, um, if they only come to one class and then they can only come once a week, you know, that's no fun. So I just encourage people, again, to listen to their body and where it's at in the moment and what they need. And I think we have a lot of our students really well trained now. It's really funny. They'll come in and they'll be like, I'm so vata today. I need this class. Oh, I or I've been so lazy all weekend. I, like they know. They're like, I need this kapha class. And so it's fun to have watched the progression, especially when I opened. People are like, you're crazy. How are you going to even explain that to people? And I was like, I don't really know. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out. But it's just, it's just patience and a, an elevator pitch for every new student. Right. Well, that, good for you for taking that on, even though I could see how people would say that's going to be quite a big challenge. But I, I think it's fascinating. And really, it, it, it gives a lot of information and sort of empowerment to your students. Like you mm-hmm. said, they're deciding, okay, this is how I'm really feeling today. And I'd like to come back into balance. Right. It's nice. So when you look at yoga business and running a yoga business, is there anything that could help out each dosha? So if you are a particular dosha and you're trying to run a business, what would help them? Is that Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ooh, good question. It's funny because I thought about creating a course on this too, just with (laughs) everything I learned. All right. Vata. Vata has the hardest time being focused. They've got all the ideas. So they're going to create this beautiful idea, this beautiful concept, um, but they need to find that grounding energy and that focus to make it happen. Because a lot of times they'll just keep creating, keep creating, and not take the time to actually fulfill what they're creating or put it into play. Um, Or they'll switch from one idea to another, like every other week. I'm Vata. So it took a lot of like, I have so many ideas, but I had to really find that grounding energy to make it manifest. Was what, are there any tools that then helped you? I think I have enough pizza in me too that I had that fire um, to stay motivated and focused. And yeah, I had that passion behind it. So I think if you are passionate enough or, you know, if you are Vata and you need more passion, maybe it is doing a little fiery yoga class or doing a meditation that is going to help better focus your attention so that you can follow through. Okay. And then the pittas in business? Pittas, they are good because they're so precise. So they're going to be really good at the bookkeeping and the organizing. Um, but they're going to really, they're going to have a hard time with going with the flow because they like to be so precise and organized. So when things don't go their way, it's going to be really rough. So they need to tap into more of that vata energy and be able to, or to learn how to be able to go with the flow and how to adjust their way of thinking when things do shift or change, which is, again, it's going to happen when you own any type of business. And I guess to 
find more of that flow is to engage in more creative projects. So I guess when Pitta would have a day, when Pitta's have a day off, they're the ones that are going to want to like finish their taxes, clean out their closet, you know, do all of that stuff. But it's, if they can fit in some kind of creative project just to let go a little bit, or even that restorative yoga class, that teaches us to let go of some of that control. Oh, this is really good. I have a friend uh, who's a painter and I love hanging out with her, but it takes me a bit to get into it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you and paint then with her? I she yeah, she's a painter and then she'll lead workshops on painting. Uh, and the pit in me is has a hard time jumping over into the creative side or just like going with it. I, I want mm-hmm. to know like what does the start of this project look like? What materials do I need? And then what are we gonna end up with? <laughs> right. <laughs> like I want it to be very organized. And she's like let's just see how it feels. And <laughs> so it's fun. You're like, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> she gets a real kick out of me. Yeah. Uh, uh, so then the Kafa business owner. Kafa's, um, la- the laziness is probably their biggest issue. And it's not on purpose. Again, they're just slower moving, have a hard time being motivated. So they're going to be, for spe- specifically for a yoga business, they're going to love it because they're going to love nurturing all of these people and just embracing them and being with them. But then when it comes to actually the business side of things, doing, doing the work might be a little more difficult. So they have to find more of that fire, more of that creative energy. And I think the biggest thing for them is just finding movement. Um, finding what's going to spark their fire or even having a plan in place just so they know that they have to do certain things every day, even if someone else creates the plan for them. Because again, once they get going, they're totally fine. So if you get them on a routine, they'll do the work. But I think it's just that initial spark to get things moving. Right. Oh, this is interesting. Do, are there people who are tri-doshic where they have all three doshas? We all are. Um, so okay. we have it all. Um, I've met a few people, but the doctors that I studied with, they say it's very rare. Um, so I sometimes don't believe people when they tell me that. Right. We'd like so to I, be. Right. And so I think it could be they're dominant in two and then maybe they're experiencing imbalance in one that can make them think they're tridosha. Um, so it is possible, but it's very rare. Right. And then what about, uh, do we, are we ever sort of in two? Do you see people that are pitta kapha or pitta vata or? Yeah, it's the same. And like, if you would take one of the tests, you might come close, but usually there's one that's going to be just a few points higher than the other one. So I think for me, like, oh my gosh, I don't even remember what the numbers are, but like I'm 17 Vata and then like 15 Pitta. So I'm close, but I'm still, I've got more Vata. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. So you also told me before we started the interview today that you have a membership site. Can you tell us, well, first of all, what what started the membership site and then what is it like? Yes. So I started it because our location, we're actually right next to the Space Needle in Seattle. So we have a lot, we have regular students, but we also get a lot of travelers. We're in a very touristy area and people are fascinated when they come, but then they leave and they're like, oh, I wish you were here or with me in my hometown. So I wanted to have something they could go home with so they could still practice with us, so they could still be part of our community. And I just wanted to reach a larger audience because I think more people could benefit from understanding their unique body type and you know adjusting their diet, routine, exercise to find optimal health and happiness. The membership site is a little bit of everything and it's really created for everybody and everybody. Um, 
So it's not like, and I'm not discouraging people from using other yoga apps or yoga videos, but a lot of them can be very intense or acrobatic. So we have yoga videos on there that are designed to cater to the doshas. So there is a vata section, pitta section, kapha section, and then I have all levels and then I have advanced. And I haven't ha- I don't have the advanced up yet. Still working on that. But the all levels it will be like one of the classes is vata and then it's um, the theme is focus. I have a vata one, the theme is hip joint health. I have a pitta one, you know, it's letting go. So you can literally pick from the yoga classes what you need. You can stream through all of the categories and be like, okay, this is what my body needs right now. And then the same for meditation classes. They're divided by the doshas and then they have like a subtopic to see what you want to meditate on. I also have a recipe section. So doshas, dosha specific recipes, also some tridoshic balancing recipes. We have a herbal formulation section that's also divided, but not by dosha. It's divided by, I think right now I have like immunity, brain health, reproductive health, and a couple other ones. So any issues you're experiencing, you can go in there and you can read about different Ayurvedic supplements and herbs to see if it might help your body. I'm trying to think what I'll say. There's a lot on the the membership site. I think I also have educational talks. So there is that a big introduction to Ayurveda, what it is, the breaking down of the doshas. And I'm planning on adding other educational um, talks that go even deeper into, you know, the food for each dosha and just other avenues. Amazing. I know a lot of our yoga teachers have been asking, like, how do I share something online? So I'm guessing these are pre-recorded and are they sort of like a, they're not of an actual class. You're, you've created the class then just for the online platform. Is that right? Yes. I have a wonderful um, videographer called my husband (laughs) (laughs) who I'm lucky enough. I was trying to do it myself and it is tough. It's really time consuming to make just one single video and make it nice. So for all of you that are doing it or trying to do it, I feel you. Um, he, He actually started going to school for, um, what is it called? I don't know, but something with film, but then he switched majors. So he has a little bit of a background, which is nice. So he'll come in and film and do the video editing. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. So then you film with a camera and do you have any tips around what you use in terms of camera and sound? Because I know this is always the number one question when moving things online. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what camera we have, but it is a nicer one. And I think we did change it or change the battery pack because you have to make sure. When I first started doing this, the camera kept turning off on me in the middle of teaching. Then I go back and I have to do it again. So you want to have a battery that lasts for X amount of time so it doesn't turn off on you. The camera we bought actually... The only bad thing about it, and maybe I can get back to you on this and you can put it in the show notes, yeah. um, because it doesn't have a plug-in for a microphone, which okay. we didn't realize, which kind of sucks. So what I actually do is I use my phone and I do the recording, use a recording app. And then we use iMovies to sync the audio then with what was on the camera. Right. Do you know which recording app it is that you use? I think for iPhones, it's just on there. Okay. Phones just have a recorder now or voice memo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then in terms of your membership site, do you use a platform that hosts the videos? Do you have a membership platform that you use? I do. I use Teachable right now. And that's, I like them right now just starting out because they're pretty cheap per Mm -hmm. month. And then you can also decide... I think what I do, I pay $38 a month and then they take a certain percentage of each course or membership that I cite. So any purchases that are made and it's pretty low, but once you start selling more, you can upgrade and you'll just pay a higher flat fee per month and then they don't take a percentage. 
Right. Okay. So it's good depending on how many customers you have. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking or for answering all of the technical side of things yeah. there. <laughs> no. And so who is your membership site more for? Do you think it's more for yoga teachers or yoga students or both? I think both. It's just yeah. a platform that has lots of tools to help you out. And <clears throat> it's more yoga students right now. But in my own journey, what I've realized is I think it's, it's good for yoga teachers too. We, we learn all of this information, right? And we're like, well, I know this. This is what I teach. I, I know this. But how often <laughs> do we do it ourselves? Or, you know, I started going to this meetup group and I wasn't going because I'm like, well, I know this. I've studied this. I can, I can do it on my own. But every time I end up going, I'm like, why don't I go every week? Like, it's so beneficial. It's so helpful to me just to remember to meditate, how to breathe, how to find, just from my particular group, you know, these, remember these positive affirmations and what I can do to feel happier and healthier. It's so true. You're right. That once we feel like, oh, I know that we, (laughs) I was having a chat with a fellow marketing uh, marketing coach and and it's easy for us to chat with the other person like oh yeah why am I not doing that in my own business when that's what we help people with every day that's really great that's the catch 22 of yoga it teachers is. it's hard like the cobbler's children's shoes or something whatever that yeah. story is <laughs> yeah <laughs> so if there's anything that you would like yoga teachers to kind of take away something maybe new that you've learned about the doshas or uh, a perspective about them or maybe even a resource to learn more what what would you like to share with our yoga teacher listeners Ooh, I think the biggest thing that I'd like them to take away in their classes is really encouraging people to listen to their body. And I think with just this basic understanding, having the verbiage to say, hey, if you're feeling this way, maybe you should do this. So these are just little tips you can do without actually having an Ayurvedic-based yoga class, but still incorporating that concept and philosophy of Ayurveda to better assist your students. Um, And then resources, I'm a big fan of David Frawley, everything. Um, And there's actually a book called Dosha, The Doshas for Your Types, or, oh no, Yoga for Your Body Type. Okay. So it breaks down yoga poses and how to do them for all of the doshas. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. I will definitely include that in the show notes then. Thank you so much. And if people want to reach out and work with you further or find the resources and maybe join your membership site, where do they go? Yeah, they can head to Eka Yoga and Ayurveda.com. All right. Thank you so much for your time yeah. today. Thank you, Shannon. Well-connected yoga teachers, how was that? What are your key takeaways? Look at how Angela took something like Ayurveda and niche down in her own studio and online. And that's really what she's known for now. I'd like to ask you two questions. One, what do you think your dosha is? Maybe you know already, maybe you know in a test. Let us know in the Facebook group. It'd be so fun to hear your takeaways from the episode and to hear what your dosha is. And two, so often I'm talking about niche work, but here's another way to ask that. What would you like to be known for? Or ask your students, what are my yoga classes like? That is what you're known for. You might not even know the style of yoga that they really resonate with and go to you for, but do a little bit of digging and research, either in your dosha or in what your yoga is. And I bet there's some parallels there. I bet you can draw some connections. Some very exciting things are coming down the line, Connected Yoga Teachers. There are a couple of ways that you can work with me. Yes, for sure, you can book a one-on-one consultation call with me. Also, group coaching is going to be opening up again in October with Amanda and I. And there's a Yoga for Public Health in-person training November 2nd and 3rd. 
And lastly, the doors to the Pelvic Health Professionals website open August the 12th, if you're listening in real time, 2019. All of that information can be found on the connectedyogateacher.com, either under trainings and events or under work with me. Thank you so much to our team over here at the Connected Yoga Teacher. Samantha, Suzanne, Crunch, and Cindy, wow, you all do so much for the team. It means a lot. You make every podcast episode possible and a lot of the other behind the scenes things. Thank you also Connected Yoga Teacher listener. Thank you for tuning in. Maybe this is the very first episode that you've tuned in for. Maybe you are coming back here each and every week and we are becoming fast friends. I would love to hear from you if that's the case. On the connectedyogateacher.com, there is a button on the homepage. Not many people use it and I love getting voicemails. So it's a way for you to leave me a voicemail and yep, you will for sure hear back from me. I answer each and every one with a voicemail back. Alrighty, Connected Yoga Teachers, it is time for me to sign off. I want to know what you will be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up.